everyone welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with molly if you are new around here if you've never seen my face before then hi my name is molly and i post true crime videos like this every single week so if you think that is something that you might want to stick around for then please do subscribe and don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that youtube will notify you whenever i post but anyway this week we are going to be talking about the song case of Jane Longhurst, a young promising musician who just suddenly disappeared one day in early 2003. Jane's disappearance just completely baffled investigators for a number of weeks as there seemed to be absolutely no trace of her anywhere. However, eventually the shocking truth surrounding her case came to light and her murderer was finally apprehended. So for today's case, we are going all the way back to the year 2003 in the city of Brighton and Hove, which is located in East Sussex on the southern coast of England. And this is Jane Longhurst. She was a 31 year old woman who at the time of this case taking place was of course living in Brighton with her boyfriend called Malcolm. Jane Longhurst was born on the 6th of November, 1971 to her parents Bill and Liz Longhurst. However, unfortunately Bill passed away just a few years before this case happened in the year 2000 after a long battle with dementia. Bill and Liz had two children in total, two daughters. Their first was called Sue and then eight years later Liz gave birth to Jane. And the Longhurst family lived in Reading so that's where Jane grew up. Liz described her youngest daughter Jane as being a late blessing because because she was around 40 years old when she had Jane and she absolutely adored her. She really, really doted on Jane and the two of them had a very close relationship. Jane was also described as always being a very happy and smiley person. She was very kind hearted and her mother said that she was just a very easy person to get on with. Everyone got along with Jane. She did really well in school growing up. She excelled in her exams. However, Jane's favorite hobby and her main passion in life was music. She absolutely loved music. I believe she played a couple of instruments, including the piano and the flute. However, her favorite instrument to play was the violin. She had been playing the violin since she was around five years old and she was very good at playing it. Jane was incredibly talented. And when she finished school, she decided that she was going to try and pursue a career in music. That was her dream. And so in the mid 1990s, Jane moved down to Brighton to try and make her dream career a reality. Not long after the move to Brighton, she joined a local orchestra where she of course played the violin and she also soon got a full-time job at a special needs school where she worked as a teacher. And just a few years after she moved, Jane started dating a man named Malcolm Sentence and eventually they moved into a flat together. And by all accounts, Jane was content with her life in Brighton. She had a lovely job as a teacher which she really enjoyed. She was still heavily involved with music in the orchestra. She had a stable income and she had a good loving relationship with Malcolm. Jane was just happy which is why it was such a shock to everyone when she suddenly disappeared in March of 2003. Specifically, it was Friday the 14th of March 2003, and that day, Jane was due to meet up with her mother Liz in London, as they were going to go to an exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery together. However, unfortunately, Liz had to cancel a couple of days before because she was ill, and Jane was fine with this. Of course, she understood that her mother was not feeling very well, and the two of them agreed to go to the exhibition the following week instead. So Jane's plans for that day had been cancelled and I think she was probably just going to stay at home for the day instead and so her boyfriend Malcolm grew pretty concerned when he arrived home that evening and Jane was not there. He had no idea where his girlfriend had gone and he just thought it was 
really odd that she hadn't let him know where she was going. Usually Jane was really good at telling people her whereabouts because she wouldn't want them to worry. Malcolm had tried to ring her phone several times but there was no answer. In fact it seemed as though her phone had been switched off because it was just going straight to voicemail. And so about an hour after he returned home Malcolm decided to give Jane's mother Liz a call to see if maybe Jane had met up with her mother that day after all maybe they had gone to the exhibition in London but Liz said no she hadn't seen or heard from Jane but she didn't panic too much she just said to Malcolm have you checked to see if she is at the Brighton Youth Orchestra because Jane would often volunteer and help out there she would teach the children how to play the violin so Malcolm kind of relaxed a little bit and he said oh yes that's probably where she'll be however about an hour later Liz received a another call from Malcolm. Jane hadn't gone to the youth orchestra and she still wasn't home. And as each hour passed, Malcolm just grew more and more concerned. He just couldn't work out where Jane had gone and why she wasn't getting in contact. After having no luck at the orchestra, Malcolm decided to start contacting Jane's friends to see if maybe she was with one of them. However, none of them had seen or heard from Jane. They also had no idea where she was. And soon it had gotten to the early hours of the Saturday morning and still Jane wasn't home. And so Malcolm knew it was time to contact the police and report her as missing. After Malcolm reported her disappearance, a couple of officers went to his flat and they just began interviewing him. They were asking him some questions about Jane and her life, about her movements from that day and whether any of her belongings were missing. Had she taken anything with her wherever she went that day? And they were able to determine that the only things that were really missing from the flat was Jane's mobile phone and her purse but that was it. It didn't seem like she had packed a bag as far as they knew she hadn't taken any clothes or anything like that apart from the clothes that she would have been wearing so it wasn't like she planned on being gone for a while as surely she would have taken more things with her. It appeared as though Jane had left the flat at some point that day and she planned on returning later on but she never did. So what happened to her that meant that she didn't come back home? In the early stages of this missing persons investigation, the police began just speaking to pretty much everyone that Jane knew. So her family and her friends and her neighbours, just in case anyone had any information about her whereabouts. But no one knew anything and soon it had been 48 hours since she disappeared and it was at this point that the case was actually referred to the CID, the Criminal Investigation Department, because this was really worrying now. In most missing persons cases the person will either be found or they will return within 24 hours but Jane had not been seen in two days now and so the police knew this was probably serious. They knew that something was wrong here. After looking into Jane and her life, the police just couldn't identify any reason as to why Jane would have wanted to disappear. She had a good life and she was happy, so they were certain that she hadn't chosen to go missing, like she hadn't decided to run away and start a new life or anything like that, so everyone really started to fear the worst. As part of this inquiry, the detectives began having a look through Jane's bank records, since we know that she took her purse with her wherever she went that day, so they wanted to see if she had used her bank card at all since her disappearance. However, her records showed that she hadn't. She hadn't used her bank card at all, which only made the police and her family even more concerned because if there was some activity on her bank account, then it kind of gives them a bit more hope that she is alive and she is using her money to buy food and perhaps pay for accommodation somewhere. 
but her money hadn't been touched. They also found through looking at Jane's mobile phone records that she hadn't used her phone since that Friday morning, so the morning that she disappeared. She had made a couple of phone calls that morning and the last one was to her best friend, Lisa. Well, she tried to ring Lisa that morning, but Lisa was actually at work at the time and so her partner, Graham Coots, answered the phone and he spoke to Jane and he explained that Lisa was at work. The police took a statement from Graham and from the other people that Jane had been in contact with that day but nothing really came from these. Her bank records and her phone records didn't offer up any leads. And so following this the detectives decided that they needed to look a little bit more into Jane's boyfriend Malcolm just in case he could have had anything to do with this. The police always hone in on the partner of a missing person or the partner of a murder victim because as we know in a lot of cases the partner is involved and so it's kind of standard procedure to investigate them first. But it wasn't just Malcolm that the police were keen to investigate, they were also questioning Jane's music teacher and her friends. They were looking into pretty much everyone that was in Jane's life and they were trying to either rule them out or identify a potential suspect in her disappearance. Meanwhile, as the police were questioning all these people, the scale of this investigation really grew. The investigation into Jane Longhurst's disappearance became known as Operation Keen and an additional 45 police officers were brought in to assist with this inquiry. These officers began conducting door-to-door -door inquiries asking virtually everyone in the community if they had seen Jane or if they had any information regarding her whereabouts. The police also started going through hours and hours worth of CCTV from the local area. They were checking cameras from railway stations and bus stations just hoping that they would spot Jane on some footage somewhere. But still, there was nothing. It literally was as if Jane had just vanished into thin air. There seemed to be absolutely no trace of her anywhere and at this point the police were getting desperate for some leads. It had been days since Jane was last seen and so the police decided to turn to the public for help and launch a televised appeal alongside Jane's family. During this appeal Jane's mother Liz urged for anyone with any information about her daughter's whereabouts to come forward and contact the police and following this appeal the police did start to receive a number of tips from the public. There were even reported sightings of Jane coming in. A number of people came forward to say that they believed they had seen Jane all over Brighton and then two other people said that they had seen Jane in Southampton and Wales and so the police had to go through all of these potential sightings and determine whether or not any of them were Jane. However, they could never confirm any of them and ultimately every single tip from the public just resulted in a dead end. Soon two weeks had passed and still there was no sign of Jane and the police knew that this was probably no longer just a missing persons inquiry. Jane had been gone for 14 days, there was still no activity on her bank card or her mobile phone, no sightings of her had been confirmed, they still hadn't spotted her on any CCTV, it was looking very likely at this time that Jane would not be found alive. They were of course still hoping that she would be found safe and well but they knew by now that there was a very very strong possibility that she wouldn't be, that instead they might find her body and that this would turn into a murder inquiry. They began expanding their search for Jane and they started searching like forests and woodlands, just large open areas around Brighton and Hove where someone might dump a body, but still there was nothing. The police were struggling so much with this investigation. One of the detectives said that it just felt really demoralising because they didn't have anything to go on in this case. There was no sign of Jane or her body and there were no obvious suspects. Most people in Jane's life had been 
pretty much ruled out entirely as having anything to do with this, including her boyfriend Malcolm. The police continued appealing to the public over the next few weeks, but it seemed as though every single lead they had would just result in a dead end. There was nothing in this case, no credible leads, no confirmed sightings, no CCTV, no suspects, no evidence, no sign of Jane. But then almost five weeks after Jane Longhurst disappeared, there was a huge development in this case when a body was found about 20 miles away from Brighton. It was the evening of Saturday the 19th of April 2003 when a local man named Daniel Fowler was driving his car down some back roads past Wigan Holt Common, which is a big wooded area not too far from Brighton. As I said, it's about 20 miles away. Anyway, Daniel was driving past Wigan Holt Common when he noticed out of his window that there was a fire in this wooded area quite close to the side of the road and so he decided to stop his car to just have a look at this fire and immediately he noticed that the flames were a bit of a funny colour. Daniel didn't want to just drive off and leave it because he was concerned that it would spread since there hadn't really been any rain recently. It had been quite a dry month and so he decided to get out his phone and call the fire brigade. Shortly after the firefighters arrived, Daniel got back in his car and he began driving away since his job was done. He had called the fire services and they had arrived so there was nothing more that he thought he could really do. However, as he began driving down the road, he noticed in his back mirror that a guy, one of the firefighters, was running after him and so he stopped the car. And when the firefighter reached Daniel, he said, you have to come back with us because it's not just a fire, it's actually a human body burning. So the police were immediately called and they arrived at the scene within minutes and the fire was put out. And the next morning, as soon as the sun rose, a team of forensic scientists went straight to the woods to begin their examination of the scene. What was clear from looking at the body was that the victim was a female, an adult female, and she was completely naked when she was found. Apart from there was a pair of tights wrapped tightly around her neck and it was determined that this body hadn't been on fire for very long when Daniel found it. In fact the police told him that if he had driven past just two minutes before he probably would have seen the person that started it. So now that a body had been found locally, the team investigating Jane Longhurst's disappearance were notified and they immediately thought that this body was probably Jane. But of course, this couldn't be confirmed just yet. The body had to be sent off for an autopsy. Because the body had been burnt and it was badly charred, the medical examiners had to use dental records to try and determine exactly who this was. And soon they were able to confirm that these in fact were the remains of 31 year old Jane Longhurst who had been missing for five long weeks. However, it was discovered during her autopsy that Jane had actually died around the time that she went missing, in fact probably on the day that she disappeared, the 14th of March. And this absolutely baffled the police because that meant that whoever had done this had kept Jane's dead body for over a month. It was also discovered in her autopsy that Jane's cause of death was strangulation, confirming what the police already thought, that she had been murdered. And then her body had been doused with petrol and set alight in the woods in an attempt to get rid of her remains. Now, like I said, Jane's body was completely naked when it was found, apart from the pair of tights that were wrapped around her neck. And these tights had clearly been used as a ligature and all of this suggested to the police that this murder was sexually motivated. Her body had been covered with a tarpaulin sheet and alongside this tarpaulin the forensic teams also recovered from the scene the little rings from the holes in the tarpaulin. If you don't know what tarpaulin is by the way I'll put a picture on screen it's like those big blue 
waterproof sheets. They found some clothing at the scene that had been burnt and also the remnants of a cardboard box. And just above Jane's head, they found a small piece of corrugated cardboard that had the word fragile stamped onto it. You know, you can get those cardboard boxes that have fragile printed on them. People often use them when they are moving house and stuff. So yeah, all of this was taken from the scene and it was collected as evidence. So now that the body in the woods had been identified as Jane, the police were under even more pressure because they now had to find out who had done this to Jane in order to achieve some justice for her and her family. But the problem was they still had no solid suspects in the case. They had no idea who had done this. They didn't know if the perpetrator was just a random stranger or whether Jane had been killed by someone that she knew. In an attempt to identify any potential suspects, the police decided to look back through Jane's case files and just go over all of the evidence and the statements that they had taken so far just in case there was anything that they missed. In particular, they were looking at the statements from people that had either seen or heard from Jane on the day that she disappeared, so the 14th of March. If you remember from earlier on in the video, Jane had made a couple of phone calls to different people on the morning that she went missing, and that last phone call that she made was to one of her best friends, Lisa. However, as we discussed earlier, Lisa was at work at the time and so instead Jane spoke to Lisa's partner Graham Coots who I believe was around 35-36 years old. Graham was also good friends with Jane and her partner Malcolm and the police did speak to Graham early on in the investigation when it was just a missing persons inquiry. However now obviously it was a murder inquiry and so as I said they were going back through his statement and when they did they realised that Graham hadn't actually given too much information about this phone call that he had with Jane. He hadn't provided too much detail about their conversation. And the detective said that he just gave them a very vague and bland account of his events from that day, from the day that Jane went missing. He hadn't told them anything that they could actually check to see if it was true, if that makes sense. So they found this a little bit odd and they decided that they should probably speak to Graham again to see if maybe he could provide any further detail or just in case he could have had anything to do with Jane's murder because we know that he was the last person to speak to Jane that day. So they went to Graham Coote's home to question him again and immediately as soon as the officers entered his home they got a really bad feeling about this man because they noticed that in his hallway he had a couple of folded cardboard boxes all with the word fragile printed on them, just like the cardboard found at the crime scene. But anyway, they sat down with Graham and they began interviewing him specifically about what he was doing on the night that Jane's body was dumped in the woods and set on fire. And his response or reaction to these questions only made the officers even more suspicious because it was clear to them that Graham was very, very nervous and on edge. And and also he just wouldn't really answer the questions directly. He just kept giving the officers very vague answers similar to his first questioning when they first took his statement. He gave a very bland account of his movements. But eventually he told the officers that on the night that Jane's body was found he had been out on a home delivery round. I think he was a delivery driver, I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, he said that he had been out doing some home deliveries and so the officers asked him if he could prove this by providing them with receipts from that evening. And so he did, Graham gave these officers the receipts that he had, however, none of these receipts were from the night that Jane was found. He could only provide receipts from like weeks before, so he couldn't 
prove that he was telling the truth. And the officers just felt quite frustrated with Graham at this point because he couldn't really give them a straight answer about anything and he couldn't prove that his story was true. And so they actually made the decision then and there to arrest Graham Coots on suspicion of the murder of Jane Longhurst and he was taken into custody. As well as arresting Graham, they seized pretty much everything that he owned, all of his belongings in his flat and they also seized his car. And when the detectives opened the boot of his car or the trunk of his car, they immediately noticed a very strong foul smell. In fact, they actually said that the boot smelt like a decomposing body had been in there which of course only made them even more suspicious of Graham Coots. Anyway Graham was arrested and he was questioned even more at the police station and he was a bit more calm and relaxed in these interviews and he insisted that he had nothing to do with Jane's murder. The police asked him what kind of relationship he had with Jane and he said that they were just friends nothing more. They also asked him when he had last physically seen Jane. Obviously, we know that he spoke to her on the phone on the day that she went missing, but they wanted to know when he last saw her in person. And he said that it was the Sunday before she disappeared. So she went missing on the Friday and Graham claimed that he last saw her the Sunday before that. He said that she and her partner Malcolm went round his flat that he shared with his partner Lisa. However, once again, just like with the first few few questionings, the police were unable to confirm that anything he was saying was true. But at the same time, they also couldn't prove that it wasn't true. They couldn't prove that he was lying and despite their suspicions, the police didn't have any concrete evidence linking this man to Jane's murder at this point. And so the police had to release him. They couldn't keep Graham in custody unless they were going to charge him, but they didn't have enough evidence to charge him so they had no choice but to let him go. But despite his release, Graham Coots was still the police's number one suspect in this investigation. They just had a hunch that he was responsible for this homicide and so they knew that they had to keep looking into him. They had to find evidence proving he was Jane's killer and just two days after they released Graham, the police did find more evidence. But before we get into that, let me just give you a bit of background information about Graham Coots. So he was born in 1968 and he was originally from Leven, which is a town in Scotland. However, eventually he and his family moved down to Cheltenham in England. Graham attended a secondary school in Cheltenham and then eventually he went on to go to college. Now, Graham wasn't the most intelligent in school. He didn't excel in his education. I think he probably just had very average intelligence. But one thing he did excel in was music. Much like Jane, music was Graham's biggest passion in life and his dream career was to be a professional guitarist. After he completed his education, he started working in many different fields. He was going from job to job. At one point he worked as a window fitter, another time he worked for a cleaning company and I think he would also play his music in a pub a couple of nights a week for some extra cash until eventually he met his partner Lisa and they moved in together. Well he moved into her flat in Brighton and from what I can gather Lisa and Graham had a very good relationship and at the time of Jane's disappearance, Lisa was actually eight weeks pregnant with Graham's child. In fact, children. She was pregnant with twins, so he was going to be a father. However, what should have been a really exciting time for Lisa actually turned into a nightmare because her partner was now the main suspect in a murder inquiry, and not just any murder. This was the murder of her best friend. Two days after Graham was released, the police were contacted by the manager of a local storage warehouse. He had been following Jane's case on the news and he felt as though he had some information that may have 
possibly been relevant to this murder inquiry. This manager told the police that he had had a customer that had recently rented a storage unit on the ground floor of the warehouse and he described this customer as just being a little bit odd and he thought he was odd for a couple of reasons. Number one being that he would constantly return to his storage unit. He had been renting it for a number of weeks now and he would visit the unit quite a lot which the manager just thought was a bit strange because normally people rent a lock up and they don't return to it that often because they don't usually keep things in there that they need if you know what i mean like normally when people rent a storage space they put stuff in there that they want to keep but they don't really have a need for it right now or they don't have space for it right now so they put it in the lockup until they do have space and they don't really return to it often but this customer just kept coming back to the unit constantly and checking on whatever was in there and the manager couldn't really work out why but like i said that wasn't the only reason this manager was suspicious he was also very concerned because he started noticing that there was a really bad smell coming from this guy's unit and then all of a sudden one day the smell just went and coincidentally the smell disappeared over the same weekend that Jane Longhurst's body was found in the woods and so the manager began thinking what if that foul smell was Jane's dead body being stored in the unit and then the smell went away because the body was moved and taken to the woods where it was set on fire. The manager told the police that this odd customer was a man named Paul Kelly and so the police thought that maybe they actually had the wrong man, maybe Graham Coots was not Jane's killer after all and that this Paul Kelly was the real perpetrator. So thinking that this could be a promising lead in the investigation, the detectives went straight to the storage warehouse and they spoke to the manager. The manager showed the police some paperwork which confirmed that the guy who had rented this ground floor unit was indeed a man named Paul Kelly and then he began showing the police the CCTV footage he had of Paul Kelly where he was constantly coming to the warehouse, checking on his unit and then leaving again. And when the police watched this footage, they were shocked because they realized that this Paul Kelly was in fact their number one suspect, Graham Coots. Graham had rented this storage unit under a fake name, Paul Kelly, but why? Why had he given the manager a fake name? What was in that storage unit that he didn't want linked back to him possibly something to do with jane's murder so the police gained access to the unit that graham had rented and when they went inside they found a number of items that would prove to be damning evidence against Graham Coots. In this lockup, they found Jane's clothing, the clothing that she is believed to have been wearing on the day that she vanished. They found her bank card, her phone, and also a blue shirt. Now this blue shirt was a male's shirt, which had traces of blood on it on the sleeve, and semen was later found on the shirt too. And the police now believed that this shirt belonged to Graham, and it was what he was wearing when he killed Jane and another item that they found in the unit was a used condom and so all of this was collected as evidence. All of this evidence painted a picture of Graham Coots killing Jane Longhurst and then keeping her dead body for just under five weeks in a storage unit. But what was even more disturbing about this is that he would constantly visit her body. Like I mentioned, the manager said that Graham or Paul Kelly would come to the lockup several times and the police couldn't work out why. What was he doing with Jane's body during those five weeks before he dumped it? And also, how did he remove the body from the lockup and transport it to the wooded area without 
anyone noticing. Well, that's what the police wanted to work out. So they began going over all of the CCTV footage at the warehouse and trying to piece together Graham's movements on the weekend that Jane's body was found. As we know, Jane's body was found in the woods on the 19th of April 2003 and Graham was spotted on CCTV at the warehouse just the day before this, so on the 18th. I'll insert some clips of the footage now, but as you can see, that day Graham entered the warehouse building, he picked up a trolley and he took it with him in an elevator to the ground floor of the building where his storage unit was. He is then caught on that same CCTV camera about six, seven minutes later, coming back out of the elevator with his trolley. However, this time on the trolley, there is a very big cardboard board box that he is wheeling around. He then exits the building with his box and he walks towards his car and the police believe that inside that box was Jane Longhurst's body. He went down to his storage unit where her body had been stored for weeks, he put her body in the box and then transported it to the boot of his car. Once he had put her body in his car, the CCTV footage shows him going back into the warehouse to presumably return the trolley. You then see Graham once again on the camera outside of the elevators and you can see him getting some tissue and kind of mopping up the floor. And the police believe that he did this because when he was wheeling Jane's body out on the trolley, some blood and body fluid must have dropped on the floor and so he realised that he needed to clean it up. So it's believed that he put her body in the boot of his car and then just left it there until the next day when he dumped it in the woods. CCTV footage was also found of Graham at a gas station buying a can of petrol on the day that Jane's body was discovered and as we know her body was doused in petrol before she was set on fire. So now as I said the police had very damning evidence against Graham Coots. Not only did they have the CCTV footage but they also had the items that they had recovered from inside his storage unit like the blood-stained shirt and the used condom and Jane's belongings. All very incriminating evidence linking him to the crime. And so of course he was arrested again on suspicion of murder. After he was arrested the police confronted him with all of the evidence that they had obtained and they wanted to see if he would now confess to the crime but to be honest he didn't really say anything he just got very upset he had his face in his hands and again just like he had done throughout this whole investigation he wouldn't really give the detectives a straight answer. They asked him what was in that big box on the pallet truck, they asked him if he killed Jane, did he strangle her, but his only response to these questions was either I don't know or I can't talk about it. On the 29th of April 2003, 36-year-old Graham Coots was charged with the murder of 31-year-old Jane Longhurst. The news that someone had been charged with her murder quickly spread around the local area and those closest to Jane just couldn't believe it when they found out who had done this. Because Graham Coots wasn't just some random stranger, he was a friend of Jane's and her boyfriend Malcolm. They used to spend a lot of time together. I believe I read on one source that Malcolm and Graham would often play tennis together and that Graham and Jane would go swimming together sometimes to keep fit. So so everyone was just in complete shock when the killer was identified. Jane had been murdered by someone that she cared about, someone that she trusted. The case against Graham Coots went to trial at Lewis Crown Court in East Sussex and it began on the 12th of April 2004, over a year after Jane was killed. And the reason the case had to go to trial was because Graham had decided to plead not guilty. Well, Graham did actually admit to being the one responsible for Jane's death, however he claimed that it was an accident and so his defence team were going to try and convince 
the jury that he shouldn't be convicted of murder because he didn't mean to kill her. And so during the trial, the defence presented Graham's version of events from the day that Jane died. Graham claimed that on the morning of the 14th of March 2003, he had spoken to Jane on the telephone after she had rung to speak to his partner Lisa. Lisa, of course, was at work that day and Graham told Jane that and the two of them just continued speaking on the phone for a little while and then Graham said that at the end of the phone call the two of them agreed to meet up and go swimming together that day since neither of them really had plans and so shortly after this Graham got in his car and he went to pick up Jane so that they could go to the swimming pool however Graham said that during this car journey Jane started to get really upset about something she started crying and so he decided to take her back to his flat so that they could have a chat and talk about why she was so upset and he said that once they were in his flat Jane just fell into his arms the two of them kissed and eventually they agreed to have sex now Graham claims that during this he asked Jane if she wanted to try something new and she said yes and so he wrapped a pair of tights around Jane's neck which she gave consent to he said that she was happy for him to do that and he said that he began masturbating whilst also gradually tightening the tights around Jane's neck and he claimed that when he finished he looked down and he noticed that Jane was now lifeless. He said that Jane had unexpectedly died from the tight ligature around her neck and he hadn't realised until it was too late. Graham said that straight after this he did run to the phone and he intended on calling an ambulance and the police but he just panicked at the last minute. He was too scared because he knew how it looked and so instead he decided to hide her body for five weeks and then dump it and just hope that it wouldn't be traced back to him. However, as I'm sure you've probably guessed, the police and Jane's friends and family did not believe this story for one minute. They did not think that this was an accidental death. They believed that this was a cold-blooded murder and so the prosecution set out to prove this to the jury. The prosecution argued that this whole accident story just didn't add up. The evidence in this case did not support this version of events. Firstly, Jane was in a relationship with Malcolm and she was very, very happy with Malcolm. They had a very good relationship so it's highly unlikely that she would want to ruin that by cheating on him with another man. Another thing that the prosecution pointed out that did not support this accidental death story was the tights around Jane's neck. As we know when her body was found the tights were still wrapped around her neck and the prosecution said well if what Graham said is the truth if this really was an accident why were the tights still wrapped around her neck? Surely if he looked down and realised that Jane was unconscious, the first thing he would do is remove the tights so that she could breathe. But he didn't. He just left them on and he clearly made no attempt to revive her. The prosecution also mentioned Graham's blue shirt during the trial, the shirt that was found in his storage unit that had blood on it. Now, as you can see from this picture, the blood on his shirt is on the sleeve and the police claimed that this indicated that Graham had attacked Jane from behind. They think that he then began manually strangling her with his hands and then the blood on his shirt was probably from where she had coughed up blood while she was being strangled. Another piece of evidence that the prosecution presented was Jane's trousers. Again, they were also found in the lockup and the police noticed that one of the trouser legs was inside out. So the prosecution suggested that this meant that the trousers had been pulled off of her rather than her taking them off herself before having sex. They believed that Graham attacked 
attacked Jane and then he removed her clothes after she was dead. Now quickly just going back to the defence, one of the things the defence argued during the trial was that during an act of erotic asphyxiation, a person can lose consciousness and die in seconds because you are obviously reducing the oxygen supply to the brain. And so the defence said that during this act, whilst Graham was masturbating and tightening the tights around Jane's neck, her death would have happened so quickly that he wouldn't have really had time to react before he'd even realised what had happened. Jane would have already been dead. However, the prosecution's pathologist claimed that actually that was not accurate. The pathologist said that it would have taken around two to three minutes for someone to pass away during this act, not seconds like the defence were arguing. So that means that Graham would have had two to three minutes to realise what was happening to Jane and stop. During the trial, the prosecution brought in one of Graham's ex-girlfriends and also an ex-sexual partner of his as witnesses. His ex-girlfriend claimed that Graham had always been into strangulation during sex and the ex-sexual partner told the court that one time Graham actually said to her, quote, I get the most awful feelings that I'm going to strangle, kill and rape a woman. This witness also also claimed that one day she found a lot of pornographic images in his home that belonged to Graham and chillingly he had actually drawn nooses around the women's necks in these images. Graham Coos seemed to have a fascination, an obsession even, with women's necks and he didn't deny that. In fact, during his cross-examination he admitted this and according to one source he had actually gone to his doctor about this before because he wanted some help with this obsession. It was discovered on Graham's computer that he had thousands and thousands of pornographic pictures saved on there and the majority of these pictures involved a woman being strangled and suffocated and tortured. It was also found on his computer search history that he would regularly visit websites called Hanging Bitches, Death by Asphyxia and Necro Babes and it was determined that his most recent visits to these websites was just the day before Jane was murdered and then a couple of days after her body was found. So based on all of this evidence, the prosecution explained to the jury what they believed really happened to Jane that day and what Graham did after the murder. So they believed that on the day of Jane's death, he invited her over to his flat with the intention of killing her. This was all planned. He had fantasies about strangling and killing women and he wanted to turn those fantasies into a reality. Like I said, it's believed that he attacked her from behind so she would have had no idea what was coming and she wouldn't have really had the chance to defend herself. They believe that he manually strangled her to death and then he placed the tights ligature around her neck probably to satisfy himself and also possibly so that he could prepare a cover story before her body was even found. He then removed her clothing because this was clearly a sexually motivated murder and there is actually evidence to suggest that he had sex with her dead body Body, at least on one occasion in those five weeks before her body was found. If you remember, a used condom was found in the storage unit and this condom contained his seminal fluid and there were also traces of Jane's DNA on the outside of it. And speaking of the storage unit, the police and the prosecution don't actually believe that Jane was kept there for the whole five weeks that she was missing. I'm not sure what evidence they have to suggest this. I'm guessing it has something to do with the date that Graham started renting the storage unit, but they think that Graham actually kept Jane's dead body in an empty flat above his flat that he had kept 
keys for and they believe that he had kept it in that flat for around 11 days and then after this he put her in the boot of his car and moved her body to the storage unit and whilst it was in the storage unit he visited her body on many different occasions I think it was between seven and nine times which to me just indicates how callous this man actually is the fact that he can move and store and visit her body for five weeks whilst he knows that there is a huge missing persons investigation going on to try and find Jane. He can watch Jane's friends and family make these emotional appeals begging for information regarding her whereabouts and this whole time he knew exactly where she was. The fact that he can do that does not indicate to me that this was an accident because he went to such extreme lengths to try and not get caught. He stored her body in a storage unit and then after five weeks he dumped it in a wooded area, doused it in petrol and set it alight, obviously in an attempt to get rid of any evidence. When the trial came to an end the jury was sent off to deliberate and it took them around nine hours to come to a verdict. When they returned they found Graham Coots guilty of the murder of Jane Longhurst and he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 30 years. However that isn't where this case ends because not long after he was sentenced in January of 2005 Graham appealed his conviction and he requested for a retrial. His defence team wanted the case to go to trial again in front of a different jury and unbelievably this request was accepted. His original conviction was quashed and his second trial began in June of 2007. Once again the prosecution presented all of their evidence against Graham and no surprise this second jury also found him guilty of murder but unfortunately this time his sentence was life in prison with a minimum of 26 years so that's four years less than the first sentence although it is still life in prison so there is a very strong possibility that he will never be released anyway and that is it for this case that is the case of Jane Longhurst a very sad case Jane was so happy in her life and she had so much potential. I really do believe that she could have had such a successful career in music but unfortunately that was all snatched away from her by someone that she was good friends with, someone that she trusted. As usual please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case in the comments and also leave me any suggestions you may have for other cases that you want to see me cover on this channel. Before I go I do just want to say a massive thank you to the members of my Patreon page. Thank you so, so, so much for your support, guys. If anyone else wants to become a member of our little Patreon family, then the link is always in the description box of my videos. Thank you so much for watching. Please do give this video a, sum a thumbs, a thumbs, a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye, guys.